Okay, since now David has shown you how to start in from the, the, the output that you receive from the sequencing company where you are doing the Illumina sequencing, you can obtain sequences. So you get a lot of DNA sequences that you call them either OTU or ASV. And what I'm going to, to tell you now is a little bit about how to, inter how to interpret the sequence, uh, what they really mean biologically. So uh, I will start with some basic, uh, some concepts about what is that gene? What is the, that SSU gene that everybody's talking about? What's its use it's, uh, and its biological meaning? And then I will show you a general procedure on how I personally do to identify the sequences that I that I get and to annotate them both uh, taxonomically and then functionally. When we know the taxonomic uh, identity of the sequences, then we can go to the function. And then I will try some some case studies, so more complicated things that you will anyway encounter when you are in when when you are annotating sequences and then give some take home messages. So first of all, what, what is the, the, so the SSU, the 18S, what is the SSU, the 18S? So the, these are different names for a, for a same gene. With prokaryotes, it's called 16S. I won't enter into the details, but that this is how it looks like. Uh, this is a 3D model of a ribosome. So actually, uh, this ribosomal gene codes for the RNA that is used in to build the small subunit of the ribosomes. This this RNA is actually um, used as such, and it's not it's not translated into proteins. And uh, and then I mean you have uh, in all the eukaryotes, including ourselves, we have multiple uh, numbers of copies and uh, sometimes very high numbers of copies. So actually, in pro prokaryotes too, uh, they have a couple of copies, but eukaryotes have even more. So the function of these genes is, is conserved in the whole tree of life, and the ribosome is used to, uh, trans for translation of protein. If you do a two-dimensional map of, this, of the small subunit of the ribosome, then you will see that you have this organization in stems and loops, uh, when you have stems, the two, well, the two parts of the stem that must match together. And uh, when you have a loop, it's more free. So the sequence of the two stems the stem must, uh, must be very conserved. Whereas in a loop, well, the size of the loop can change. And of course, the sequences can change. So you have, this means that you have evolutionary, very conserved region in the SSU and uh, evolutionary uh, less conserved. So by aligning the, the sequences that, uh, that are very conserved, you can build, like Carl Wusse did in 1977, build a tree of all living things, and that's how he discovered the existence of the archaea. And then if you align the more variable regions, uh, that's how you're supposed to differentiate between more closely related organisms. If we take the full length of this SSU, you, you probably know that there are several variable regions in this SSU and, and, several, and also several conserved regions. The, the variable regions have been named from V9, V1 to V9. And as you can see in this, in this uh, Shannon entropy plot, there, uh, there is more entropy in these variable regions, whereas the most, most conserved regions are, uh, you see less entropy then. For uh, metabar coding, the regions that we use are either the V4 or the V9 region. Well, when you are planning your experiment, so what is the, what is the best region to be used? It depends on what you want. Basically, you would have the, the V4 has good phylogenetic information because, because it's a little bit larger. It has also a better taxonomic resolution, but beware, and I will tell you about this afterwards. And there is a good database on that region because it's uh, situated in the middle of the gene. So when people were doing phylogenies, they tended to use that to get that region in their alignments. The cons here are more the, that the Flanking regions of this V4 are kind of moderately conserved, so 
it, they don't catch all the eukaryotes, so you get a more biased picture than for the V9. And uh, for some groups, it might be too long for, uh, let's say, present Illumina technology. Maybe, maybe some, some developments later will allow uh, larger sequencing, or if you're using, for instance, uh, long read, uh, high throughput sequencing methods like, like bio, that's something else. Uh, and the V9, well, it's the opposite, but it's it's way more conserved in the flanking region. So you, you get also some more um, divergent eukaryotic groups. But then it's almost impossible to build a tree, well, a, a reasonable tree with, with the V9 region. Where is it? Whereas it's uh, kind of possible with the V4, you get supports in, on your tree that somehow resemble what you will you would have with a uh, Full, full gene. So in that sense, it's not that bad. Now I come with the problems. The primary pair that I give you here as, a, as an example, and this is on the V4. Nowadays, most of the people are sequencing V4, although we give an example in the V9. This pair of primers, the Stoketal, uh, is actually um, amplifying the different groups of, um, of eukaryotes in a biased way. So Okay, here you see well the excavates don't exist anymore, but still, I mean, uh, there is there um, most of the excavates are not correctly amplified, and then you see in the other groups that the proportion really varies, and this can be an issue if you're working in environments where you have a lot of these organisms. Then it it can be a matter also of length. So if the amplicon size, as I said before, if the amplicon amplicon size is too large then you are into trouble and you don't get the group or you don't get the sequences. So actually I, I'm giving this example, not because they are bad, because I think they're a good primary pair, but uh, I give this example because this is, um, this is one of the most used uh, primary pairs for uh, DNA environmental DNA surveys. And then we must talk about the, I must talk to you a little bit about the quantitative aspects. Uh, when you're doing metabar coding, most, I mean, the idea behind is to do ecology and ecology cannot go without any quantitative aspect. So uh, you can hear many things about the quantitative aspects. So uh, the number of reads for your OTUs or ASVs, uh, I even read in some papers that you should only use presence absence, so the quantitative aspect, forget about it. So this is, it's not that bad. I think people have, are being extremely crit crit critical about this, this thing. Mm, the correspondence, which is certainly difficult, is to say we have so many, uh, we have that many uh, reads from, from our OTU, then we have that many organisms. The direct correspond correspondence and even a proportional correspondence doesn't really work, but it does work with the biovolume, or at least to a certain extent. And here I have a, a reference that I found in a, in a very recent paper from this year, where they find an allometric uh, relationship between cell volume and uh, the number of small subunits ribosomal genes per cell. And this works for all domains of life because you can see in the, in the graph that they have also archaea and bacteria. And um, if so, how does it work in, in real life? So we have several examples where we see this kind of uh, linear um, uh, relationship. Of course, if you are, it depends where, where you are in, on the bio volume and, and the um, and, and on the allometric relationship, but your if you are in a in a bio volume that includes most of the protists, then the relationship becomes almost linear. For instance, we have a, um, but we have we can have even good correlations between the number of metazoa and the number of parasitic apicomplexa, which are uh, parasites of metazoa that you find in the soil. That's that's one of uh, David's last papers from last year. And then you can also see sometimes it even works with number of individuals if the, if the, the organisms have similar sizes. For instance, um, this, uh, this paper by 
by Giner et al. shows that there is a direct relationship between the number of high throughput sequencing read and the, and the, the counts that you can obtain by doing uh, fish. So fluorescence in situ hybridization on planktonic organisms. So actually it works pretty cool. Now, how to classify these sequences? So sometimes you, you, you find people that will tell you, okay, we have a, uh, we have a, an SSU uh, sequence, we have an OTU, then it means 100% and we, it means that we have the species. So looking at several, um, and several markers that we use for uh, metabar coding, you can see that we share the same V9 with the elephant. And you can see if, if you're into V4, then we don't share exactly the same sequence with the elephants, but still we're over 99.8%, which means that any clustering algorithm, uh, you can use data too, or you can use whatever you want, uh, they will consider that the elephant is equal to us, basically. So we are elephants. Then if you, if you go into the ITS or 20S region, there we can differentiate these different organisms. Well, uh, it means that you would dump all the, the mammals together. And of course, if you're looking at the function of these different organisms, well, we can understand that between the between a, a cat and an elephant, we don't have the same function in the ecosystem. So now, what about protist? Well, protist is even worse. So you you see that some very closely related ciliates, for instance, can have very similar SSU RNA gene sequences, like this this huge uh, undescribed ciliate that uh, William Feuchtner found in um, in bromeliads and tetraimina corlisi. So you can see that the one fits uh, very nicely inside the other. But when you're looking at this, uh, the, the, at these picosoecids uh, on, the, on, the, on the left, of the, on the right of the screen, uh, this uh, very small organism, they almost look like each other, but still they have 94% similarity. So if, if we go back to our animal model, this would mean that these two species would be just as far related as we are from, um, from a, basically a bony fish. Let's put it like this, a sardine. So there we have a problem. Another problem, another problem is the intragenomic polymorphism. And this, this issue is particularly important with the groups that have very long very long SSU sequences like the, the Mexomay seeds, where we can find that within a single genome, you can have uh, differences of up to 1.5% between the copies. And this means that your organism has, has several versions that can be 1%, 1.5% different from each other to 5.5% uh, difference within a single for a miniferon cell. So there you can imagine that this may cause a lot of um, overestimation of the diversity. So in the end, we are allowed to say, but what, what are we looking at? In the end, it, it's no use to do what we are doing because the picture of diversity is completely biased. So we, we have uh, also a taxonomic resolution that varies anyway between the groups, uh, but most often, and this happens with most, most, of, the, um, most of, the, um, of the eukaryotes, it doesn't really fit with species level identification. And what we need actually is species because species, all the, the literature in protistology and other, other fields of research has been done on species, on identifications. And then you have, Moreover, you have intra-individual polymorphism. But there is, uh, I would say, let's stay positive. I think that in any way that you're looking at environmental phenomena, you will look through biased glasses. If you're trying to count individ your individual cells, or if you're trying to culture them, you will anyway fall into big biases and you won't, you won't be able to uh, to observe everything that there is 
So uh, meta barcoding is still much better because there you will, you will get all the cryptic species, unconspicuous organisms that you will never be able to observe, everything that is host associated. Then the good point is that data can be at least semi-quantitative, but I think it's more accurate than that. And there we have still a very big, very good tool for, um, for uh, microbial ecology. And then if you're working with eukaryotes, you have the possibility of infer inferring the functions of the organisms that provided you with, um, with the OTU. Now let's, let's have a try. We will try to, to do the exercise to, to kind of um, see what, where we get. So what do you do when you, get, when you have um, one of these uh, ASVs, no? Well, the first thing that you would do is to blast it against GeneBank. So GeneBank is the, still the database that has the most, uh, the most sequences and the most references. It has also the environmental sequences. So it will be anyway more complete than PR2 or uh, Silva or anything else. So how does it work? So you, when you, you submit your, your, your sequence, then uh, what BLAST will do is that the, the algorithm with par will parse nucleotide sequences into, into small, uh, for instance, it can be 11 letters, but that you can, you, you can, you can adapt some into words. Then it, it, ident it goes through the whole that sequence database and compare these words with the, with the whole database and identify those that have the exact word matches. And then when it finds, finds it, it extends the sequence comparison between your sequence and the, the database in both directions. And then it reports the hit as long as it, it uh, meets the requirements uh, set off by BLAST. I just take one example from the Excel file that uh, uh, David has made available. So, one sequence that is um, that is related to Chytridomycetes, and the match is 97.8 percent with uh, with genus Rhizoclus matthew. So, what I'm doing here is that I okay I copy paste the sequence here into the so I go to to nucleotide blast and copy paste the sequence here. Then I check, okay, this must be, I must compare with the uh, standard databases and not our RNA or ITS database because then, uh, well, it's, uh, it's limited to certain groups and it's not good for us. We wanted to check it with all the database. Well, that's something that we have to select if we organize for highly uh, similar sequences or other types of BLAST sub-algorithms. So what do we choose? Mega, so that we have these three options, Mega Blast, Discontinuous Mega Blast, or Blast N. So Mega Blast is something that you, that you will use when you have a high similarity between uh, your sequence and, uh, for instance, well, and the database. So you can see it with the um, match, the vSearch match, match with PR2. So you have, a, okay, um, there the word, will be large, the word size will be large, and then you have a high match and mismatch scores and high gap penalty. So it won't tolerate many differences with the, with the sequence that is in the database. And this works, this is quite fast. And it gives you, it provides you with, an, with the answer quickly. Then you have the discontinuous metablast, which allows uh, gaps and mismatches, which is useful in cases that you have, for instance, small introns insertions or longer sequences. And then when you have like more divergent sequences, then it's more tolerant. And then you have the blast M and the blast M is basically the same as this continuous mega blast, but you can lower the word size down to seven. Uh, I usually don't do that because uh, most of the time you will have Curious uh, correlations that we come out, and you will have genes that have nothing to do with uh, with um, basically uh, 18s. So I don't think blast is very useful. I just use discontinuous mega blast. But okay, that's what we obtain.
the best match that we can see here is Rhizoclosmatium pesaminum, 98.54%. So this is the, the percentage of identity that you must look at. And then you must look at also at the, the query cover, so uh, how far it really queries all the power. This means if you're looking only at a part of the sequence or, or if in the, in the database, the whole sequence that you are, want to compare is already present. So it, here it covers 100%. So it, so it means that you have, the, you have kind of a full alignment and this provides you with some security that you can trust these results. Then you can ask for a, that's something I, I very often do is to ask for a distance tree of the results and, and Blas can calculate also a distance, a small distance tree. If you click here, that's what you get. So your query is in yellow. That's what you're looking for. And then you have, so this is the big genus uh, Rhizoclosmatium. So you will have something that is uh, related to Rhizoclosmatium, but beware because uh, it still branches outside. And uh, look that there are other genera that are kind of enclosed within Rhizoclosmatium. So you would have Odontochytridium, Obelidium, Siphonaria, and all these, these genera. So you must know that uh, first, this tree is not a tree that you would do with a nice alignment and so, so it's kind of quick and dirty. And then you must know also that there are mistakes in gene banking. So you, you, you still have to, to kind of be aware of that. But at, as it looks like, it seems that we have um, something that is close to genus Rhizoclosmatium, but possibly it might be another genus. Then there I show you a phylogeny of Rhizoclosmatium. So you can see where the different species are. And okay, I mean, you have uh, certainly Obistoconta, certainly fungi, certainly Chytridomycetes, and certainly Chytridialis. Now, if it's Rhizoclosmatium or not, this is what, what remains to, to be determined. But still, you have an organism that is saprotrophic, so it's not phagotrophic, it doesn't eat actively uh, other organisms. And then, uh, I mean, we know that re genus Rhizoclosmatium and closely related genera are specialized in chitin de degradation. Uh, this is logical. There's a lot of kittens in the kitten in the um, in the peat box. I mean, kittens are uh, insects. Um, it, it, it's it's in the in on the insects, but also on many other micrometazoa. It's also on certain proteins. There you have a species called Yellowstenia papilio. It's a it's a that has a that has a shell that closely resembles kitten. So actually, uh, it makes sense to have this kind of fungi in those places. I'm coming to some more compl complex things now. I, I think this is, illustrates the thing that you have. You must also always have some. Be careful with the results that that um, that research is giving you, and PR2 also. So that's that's why I intitulated this when PR2 fails. So you get here the closest match with 89%. There we are more far related. So the closest match here is uh, Terranova Caballeroi, which is a nematode. Terranova is that. So it's a marine fish parasite, and it's, uh, it's rather closely related to the Anisakis. I don't know if you heard about those, but when you're, you, you want to buy fish to make some delicious sushis, uh, sometimes you cut on the salmon or you cut on the on the tuna, and there you have some uh, often living uh, small worms that try to escape. So these are these are the anisakis, and Terranova is related to those guys. So you you would not expect that in the pit bog, really. Uh, there are no big fishes in the pit bog. So let's use blast. We blast. We do exactly as we did before. Now, because 89% similarity is quite far related, so we, we kind of try with a discontinuous megablast with a word size of 11, and that's what we get. So we get uncultured eukaryotes, and this doesn't help us because uncultured eukaryotes can be anything. 
But the closest match here that we find is Dicheline, identified match, the Dicheline cotylephora, fish parasite, so 93%. If I, if I go to, to the distance tree of results, there I see where our ASV is supposed to branch. So this group is free living. They are plectidae. If someone knows about uh, nematodes, these guys are bacterivorous, free living. OK. Uh, these guys are fish parasites. Yeah, a little, they look like they're a little bit further related, but still, these are frog parasites. There are frogs in these peatlands. This could be as well. And then, well, this is an insect parasite, and there you have some bird parasites. So actually, what do we know about them, uh, about the ASV? Okay, we know that the closest match is this Gelina cotylephora, that probably it's a non-barcoded genus, so that's why we ask, please, taxonomists, we need more taxonomists, just, just only for that. So to give a correspondence between OTUs or ASVs and uh, true organisms that really exist. And then, well, about the classification, but, well, it should be in the chromidorea, but we don't know. What we know is that this is a nematode. And for the functional uh, annotation, if it's a plectida, then it is bacteria. Otherwise, it might really be an animal parasite. Okay, so this was one example. I will give you another example, which maybe you might like. This is for the foreign people. So can we find a foraminiferum in the pit box? So here we, we have a sequence. I found a sequence which was related or related somehow by uh, using this search related to so to the Rotalida. So can we find this kind of organisms in a pit bog? We do the blast, also with this continuous mega blast, and we see that actually it's true. That the closest match is a foraminiferum-like prot protist, but still 88.1%. And this comes from lake sediment. So well, uncultured foraminifera means that the person who identified this sequence said this is a foraminifera, and then you're free to trust him or not. Uh, but the closest identified match comes with a red algae, alga. And you should know that red algae sometimes have very long branch sequences, and uh, sometimes, I mean, they act very weirdly in the phylogenies. And the other matches uh, are really with far related organisms. So let's try to do a distance tree to see if we understand something better. Well, it branches somehow with um, our, our, so our OTU branches somehow with the red algae, with the non -tion culture forming different, but also with the group three microsporidia. That's what we obtained. So this is. This is like very far related organism. So we still don't have the answer. I will try to, to get a little bit further. So you see red algae and green algae. I will try to look how our sequence aligns with the other organisms. So we see that if I compare with the green algae, there are like chunks of sequences which are which appear like gaps and we know that the the microsporidia have undergone a kind of devil like evolution and the, the eight, their 18s sequences have tended to shrink through the evolution these are okay these are obligate parasites and uh, this is very common in parasites that they have very divergent sequences. In, in that case, well, even the, um, the 18S went through a process of simplification. So if you look at our sequence, you compare it with the microsporidium and with the uncultured foraminiferum, or supposed foraminiferum, you see that even though they are not closely related, at least they match to, to a good extent. 
And uh, whereas here we have a lot of gaps with uh, Leptophilis conferta, which suggests that, okay, they have a different organization, a different stem and loop system. So we have to be careful. These are the, these gaps that I'm showing you. That what I've tried to do, but this is okay. This doesn't work that well with the um, uh, with the V9 region. But still, a good idea is to blast half of your sequence independently from the the other half. And we obtain um, this is what we obtain. So like 97 percent with the microsporidian and uh, with our query. So it really looks like what we were looking for is is a badly identified microsporidian and not foraminiferum. So actually that's where the where this sequence should fall. It would fall within this group called the classical microsporidia that are um, actually uh, parasites, as I told you. And this is the most probable taxonomic identification. So sorry, there are no forums and no rotalids in that big dog. These are these were a couple of examples, and I wanted to provide you some take-home messages. So the, the gene coding for the SSU RNA, I think we can still consider it as the best marker gene for surveying the whole diversity of environmental uh, eukaryotes. If you were interested by specific grow groups, there it, it really depends on your, your questions, of course, then you, you might go for a specific genes. ASVs and OTUs don't represent the exact species composition. You can interpret them as the diversity proxy. Yeah, as I told you, when, when we observe natural phenomena, we're always looking through um, biased glasses. And as far as we acknowledge that these, these biases exist, then you're fine. The, the issue comes when, when you're not aware of these biases. Then uh, the quantitative aspects are more or less reliable and I think rather reliable. Um, then you should know that the taxonomic uh, identification with research and peer two works most of the time and this is I mean I just took some special examples. Of course, if you look at most of the OTUs, you can identify them easily. So you can do it in a very automated way. But sometimes you issues come and there you can resolve them the way I told you. Of course, the issues come with the long branch in taxa. Before doing this kind of exercise, you must know, I mean, more than a little bit, you, you, you must know quite well eukaryotic phylogeny, know the groups, who is who, and what they're doing. And okay, I mean, uh, functional annotation, I think it, it really works, but in some groups, of, co of course, it might be tricky, but in general, they, they work uh, in a, they work well so that that was it if you have any questions i'm glad to try to answer i think there is one in the in the chat sorry there is a paper just out from uh, jan pavlovsky that describes the importance of uh, fresh water and soil for them because there yeah. is farms in soils also so we we always read that uh, forums are marine species. It's not totally true because you can find them also in fresh water and in soils, but they are less studied than in a marine environment. That's the same for tested amoebae uh, that we study a lot in peatland, but you can find uh, tested amoebae in soils also. So yeah, it's just because most of the scientists study one environment, you can find this organism in other environments also. Yeah, basically, if you if you want to to see how they look like, there is a there is a very good um, website which is called arcela.nl, um, where where you have illustrations of where there are many tested amoebae, but there are also forums and freshwater forums, also soil forums. So they they are they are quite funny actually. They are very beautiful. Can I ask one question? You showed this percentage from 100 till 80. And what do you think, what is the best practice if you have 10,000 of these sequences? What's, what's, what to do? <laughs> that's the best question. 
of course, I mean, it really depends what you want to do. And of course, if you have 10,000 OTUs, you can't do what I'm doing here. You can do what, you, what I'm doing here. That's, that's totally normal. Then I would say you must apply this, this view that, okay, what we are looking at is anyway biased. So when we did the, this, this study with, uh, with, with the, we were the, the three of us, so there was, uh, there was Guillaume and, and David, and we did this study to comp of comparisons across environments of soil, fresh water, and marine. We had like more than 10,000 OTUs, of course, and it was completely impossible. So there are small mistakes there that, that come out. I mean, we found some supposedly um, soil radial areas, which is totally wrong. I mean, this cannot be, or you can go and debug all, the, all these weird things, but I don't think, I mean, to do it systematically, that doesn't work. If you're doing small scale studies, but you're really interested into the, the taxonomic affiliations of all these groups, then you, there you can do what, what I'm saying. Okay, if you have 10,000 um, um, ASVs, it means that the, I mean, the tail of the distribution anyway will be not very valuable from the ecological point of view. I mean, it's always the discussion between the rare biosphere, but how far do, can we really reach that rare biosphere? We get the sequences, but we don't know which of these sequences really belong to actual organisms. So in that sense, I would say, forget about most of the identification of most of these rare guys and focus on the most common ones. This is also another approach. Um, um, but about the uh, threshold, uh, you will, will you advocate some uh, threshold where you say, okay, that's, I can live with this, uh, and I filter all my 10,000 uh, OTUs, OTUs or ISVs and say, I will take only 97, or I will yeah. take only species which were in more than three replicates from uh, five or uh, something like this, or how you will deal yeah. with this? Answer this question. What we are using as a first threshold usually is a 70% similarity. And we expect that if it's uh, higher than 70%, it's a protist <laughs> and it's not a bacteria. So it's a first threshold. But then it's very difficult to say, okay, uh, if I cut at 80%, I will be at the family level, for example, because you don't know. And depending on the group you are studying, it will not evolve the same way. So you cannot really fix a threshold for the whole diversity of eukaryotes because it's really group dependent. Uh, this kind of threshold. Well, I, I think I think the idea was that uh, how far we should we go with this uh, taxonomic identification. So if we say okay, we forget like nine, we forget ninety nine percent of the sequences, or we forget like fifty percent of the sequences, or so. That that was that your question. Uh, and the question you, is, will you keep uh, this uh, from the list of your slides? Will you keep this uh, percentage or this ISV with 89%, uh, for example, uh, in your list, or you will uh, deal with this? Or you will just keep all, it does not matter if it's 70%, 80 or 100, you will keep everything and uh, you will go for another step, like I will avoid if it was a very seldom sequence or... Yeah, that's that's what what uh, I mean. There are data; these data are there. I mean, you can still call them un unidentified. And then the, I think the percentage, and that I think that's what David was saying. Um, it really the percentage really depends on the on the groups you're looking at. So, for instance, the apicomplexans. For instance, if you have a sequence that is seventy percent similar to an, to apicomplexan, then you have a whole list of apicomplexans. Then you can say most often that this is an actual apicomplexan, because this, these sequences are anyway very far related from each other because they evolve very fast, but still they would branch very robustly together. So you would have a, really an apicomplexan. When you have other branch with small other organisms with smaller um, branch length like ciliates, chrysophyse, and all this, then I think. With a threshold, I would fix it at ninety percent. You see, it's kind of you have to to know and to to read about these things and that's yeah, and, and maybe you don't have to check 
all your ISV, but at least if you want to discuss a specific ISV in your paper, this as SV should be checked manually. It will avoid you to publish error like a marine rabbit in the middle of the ocean because it's just a misidentification uh, of, uh, of your ISV. So if you want to discuss a precise one, this one you should really check to be sure that what you are describing is fine. But then overall, the, 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 the most abundant one should be well assigned. Generally, you have some issues when you are, you are in this scale of diversity. I have one question related to the um, functional traits uh, um, assignation. Like um, uh, very concretely, when you have I don't know uh, the thousand, several thousand of uh, of uh, species, you do everything by hand. No. Or, no. Ah, okay. I was like, oh. that, that was what I was discussing before. It really depends on I think on the case and when 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 you can do that, you do that. If you can't, well, and then just uh, like I, I said to 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 Danny. I think that uh, if you have tax that are kind of crucial, that are very yeah. interesting, uh, you would do the full exercise and you will try to identify them as the best that you can. You won't just be saying that, okay, we have radiolarians in the soil or whatever, or in the peat bog or whatever. But if, you, if you're just, I mean, looking at the rough diversity, you just can't afford doing that for 10,000 10,000 OTUs or ISVs. Where do you find the functional annotation of uh, different taxa in okay. GeneBank? Um, actually, no, no, in GeneBank not. Uh, you, you must do it well by searching literature search. And um, there is a, there is a um, paper that came out two years ago. It's uh, Adel et al. Uh -huh. in the Journal of Eukaryotic Microbiology, and it has some hints about annotation, at least the big groups, and then they kind of selected some of the groups and uh, went a little bit deeper into that. So this is already a good start. And then, of course, you, you need for some groups, it's not that easy, so you need to kind of know a little bit the phylogeny, and know which are the clades that do, for instance, that are like this phototrophic, phagotrophic, or who are, who, are, who are the parasites. And at least to this level, you can reach, I think, most of the time pretty easily. Okay. Then if you want to go deeper into that, uh, then it's possible for some groups, well, typically the ciliates, you hear a lot about ciliates, I think these are the most popular protists. And uh, for these ones, you can you can know that for most of the groups, uh, you can only go to, uh, I mean, the level like consumers or uh, phototrophic or mixotrophic. If I have, we sampled a mountain lake in southern Siberia, and some colleagues of, of mine, they uh, identified phytoplankton species. Uh, under the microscope, we also sequenced uh, V4 uh, for metabarcoding. How far do you think is it possible or not? Probably not. Uh, to match morpho species to uh, some of those sequences we got. Uh, so let's say we have a morpho species that is not in the database, but we have uh, several sequences. Can we guess? which sequence would match to that morpho species? Yes, you have to, you, if you want to do that, there are some works like this that have been done. And I think it's very interesting because we always need to land on earth, like kind of um, the truth is what is there. So um, of course you go much further into the knowledge of the diversity but if, if you can really compare to what you see, this is very interesting also because you can compare to the older literature and what has been done before. So, uh, but for to do that, you, you must know your, the phylogeny of your taxa very well. And, um, and of course you cannot say 
well, I have this morphospecies, this corresponds to this ASV. I think it's very difficult to say that. Mm -hmm. Because unless you have, because all the things I told you about, because um, uh, first, I mean, you, you can have very closely related uh, morphospecies that would produce the same ASV. And then uh, you cannot really make the two match. And uh, also you can imagine other situations that, I mean, well, so either the, the V4 is not variable enough or either the, the V4 is too variable or just because some of your morpho species are, have never been barcoded, so you find an ISV and you don't know what it means. So I think all these cases, you will have them. So this is somehow somehow difficult to, even if you choose taxa, it will be somehow difficult to make exact matches, at least with the, with, with the SSU or the V4. But still, I think it makes sense to do a comparison between the things that you that you see and the composition of the of the communities. Okay, you have a lot of diatoms. You have those genera that are represented in the diatoms, and this corresponds to our observation of so many diatoms. And uh, so, to do this kind of comparison, but not in a very accurate way, but just to illustrate that what you see is also what you get is something very valuable, I think. There is Magali that made a comment in the chat. Sometimes you can get pollen in the middle of the ocean and it's explained by transport. That's totally true and there is a biological reason. But what I have said with the marine rabbits is just that there is a publication and they don't check at all the assimilation. Of course, you can have different things in the ocean, but find a, a, a rabbit in the middle of nowhere, maybe not. I don't think it was from a publication. I think it was a presentation. So Edward commented about this. But there are all things about uh, clone libraries, you know, from the beginning of the two, years 2000, whereas, where, and I don't remember the author. Even if I did, I would not comment. But somebody who found uh, mammals in the, in the plankton, and by saying, "Okay, these are maybe they are cells that have been removed from uh, from marine mammals," so I was expecting the little mermaid there. But uh, you, one has to really be careful with the data. So there is also the principle of parsimony also works. And of course, you can have the little mermaid. <laughs> But uh, it's not the most likely. The most likely is that you have contaminated your things with your big fingers and that this mammal is you. <laughs> Maybe you're yeah. the little nervous, though. Yeah, and one message of uh, Enrique's presentation is you should uh, understand the, the groups that you explain in your paper. And it's true that with the V9 or the V4, you can obtain the whole diversity. But then you should really uh, read some publication of this group and don't just put some random name in your publication and say we found that, 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 and that, and you have no idea of who are there. So that's an important point, I would say. Yeah. There is a question, maybe, uh, Guillaume, you, you know this, these things in the chat. Could LCA-based classification help? I don't know this method. The what is LCA? Yeah, I say it's, it's least common ancestor. Um, it's when you mm -hmm. you have multiple best matches uh, for a, a query sequence, and actually that's that's what I am doing. Also, it's to so if you have um, so to tackle some issues like uh, misidentification if one sequence is misidentified in your gene bank reference or in PR2, it's assigned to an insect and blast of a protist. And, and you have 10 best matches, which match one protist species. And one of the best match is assigned to an insect. Then the you can build a consensus uh, taxonomy of this uh, best matches. And you go back up to the least common ancestor. And of course, if one is insect, um, so you still have a 90 percent consensus for your protist species, so you, you will assign correctly to the protist species. 
and and if you don't accumulate enough variation to separate between um, species or even uh, genera, and that they all have the same um, V9 sequence, for example, and then you go back up until uh, you find a consensus taxonomy. Like if you don't have a consensus taxonomy at species level, then you go back up at genus. And if you are still below like 60% consensus at the genus level, then you go back to the family and so on and so forth. So, um, and that should be the best uh, way to, to assign taxonomy. And, and you will see that if you don't have enough variation, a nucleotide variation in your sequence to assign deeper than the family level, then you will only have a, a taxonomy until family level with this approach. Now, for, about paleoecology, the, the idea, well, that's always in the air, would be to mix the two approaches between, uh, well, paleoecology, but with DNA, so ancient DNA. So th th there are there are papers about this, and some somebody, there's not a lot of people who did that. Mm -hmm. but there are papers about this, um, so it seems that ancient DNA is rather preserved in the, the anoxic sediments. Oh, and you yeah, can yeah, okay. you can look at uh, ancient communities that but of course you you must get rid of all the actual organisms that are living actually uh, the idea is quite cool and it would be really really nice to do but it needs a lab that is very well equipped yeah <laughs> and it needs also that you know how to do these things so I wouldn't do it just on my bench like this, because then you're most likely to get all kinds of contaminations from everything that's all around. It's, dif oh, yeah. it's, it's difficult, but I think this is a, it's something that one has to learn, but somehow it must be possible. Uh -huh. And I would try uh, with um, group-specific protocols, so you, you're less likely that, than to get your whatever fungus or little flagellates or any contaminants or things like if i can add maybe something about this ancient dna question it's it's really interesting and that's something in the future that will be developed i'm sure but uh, with this workshop you you have seen all the issue we have with the recent and when you do the ancient dna you will have the same issue as us plus other more issues related to this specific DNA. So I'm sure in the future, when, when we will, will have resolved all these kind of issues, it will be a bit easier to assess uh, DNA in course. And I'm sure we will obtain some cool results, but we should go step after step and yeah, try to do the things in the, the right direction. As Enrique say, the good way is to focus on one group and try to learn very well how it works with this group. And then you can test in the core if you can find the ancient DNA in a way it works. Yeah.